Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you all to what is now our second event for Adam Smith Week. This is always an exciting uh, time of year and a week for us here at the Center for Public Choice and Market Process. To those of you who do not know me, I'm Professor Peter Calcano. I'm the director of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process. Uh, Adam Smith Week is really sort of our marquee event every year. It is the thing that we have begotten, we've become the most known for, at least on campus and actually outside of uh, uh, campus. We actually have visitors from out of state that have come here just this week to observe us for Adam Smith Week. So I'm <coughs> proud of what this has uh, become to. This is our 11th annual Adam Smith Week. Uh, we have a very exciting um, week planned for all of you. Uh, but let me, before I get into that, let me just say a few um, words about the Center for Public Choice and Market Process. Okay. Um, the mission of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process is to advance the economic, political, and moral foundations of a free society. And we do this through a variety of programming um, activities. We have a regular reading group for students every semester. We do weekend events for students regarding um, discussion colloquiums where they read and then they come in and they discuss with faculty members. We have um, Adam Smith Week and another speaker series, Free Market Speaker Series, which is throughout uh, the academic year. And then we have our Market Process Scholars Mentoring Program. So our Market Process Scholars Mentoring Program is to identify uh, students early on who are interested in economics and political economy and we try to help mentor them throughout the, their time here at the College of Charleston uh, to prepare them for both perhaps the academic as well as the professional world. Um, this week our theme for Adam Smith Week is the economic way of thinking and you saw, for those of you that were at our session earlier today, we've seen the obvious of how economics can be applied to public policy. Uh, tonight we're going to have something perhaps a little lighter, but also hopefully something that's exciting for you and showing you all the different ways in which economics can be applied to different areas. Um, so we have a panel of speakers today, and to actually introduce them, I'm going to step down here and I'm going to introduce one of our market process scholars, Amelia Janansky, who's going to introduce uh, our panel. so forth, but before I do, let me just do something because I'd be amiss. You'll notice on the slides that are going through, there is a link. Um, people were asking about attendance sheets. There's a link here for a URL. That is where you can, if you go to that link, you'll fill out a survey and then you'll have the opportunity to put your name and your professor so that we will then get that information to them if they are here for, if, if they are needing that information. Um, and I'll make sure to put that link back up. Um, before the end of the event. All right, so one of the things that I think is interesting is, again, is that economics can be applied to so many different areas. And tonight we're gonna to talk about three areas, uh, gambling, uh, sports, and reality TV. And I can say that I've had the pleasure of co-authoring uh, with Dr. Walker and Dr. Sobel, and I keep hoping that Dr. Witte will bring me on something at some point in time. But, Dr. Witte is, uh, among other things, has a 
achieved the status in my mind that um, I envy greatly, which is he was able to use uh, the Lee Corso's phrase, not so fast, in a research article. Right? Um, for those of you who are uh, college football fans, you'll get that reference. I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about that tonight. So I'm going to uh, literally pass the mic down and let each of uh, these people talk a little bit about their research, about their work, about how they've applied economics to their fields, and then we'll open it up for any um, question and discussion. Thank you, Eugene. So. Okay, so um, as he uh, as, as mentioned, I study gambling, and uh, I feel kind of like Chairman Kim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, Gambling, I think, is an interesting application of economics, and it's one that I've pretty much studied my entire career, beginning in uh, grad school. And when uh, Professor Calcano, we actually went shared an office at Auburn, and uh, when he was there studying hard, I was sometimes uh, on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi visiting casinos, uh, which of course was for research. But it turns out that that was a good, uh, a good topic to get into, where the timing of it was good, because it was at a time when Casinos were just starting to spread outside of Atlantic City and Las Vegas. So I just happened to be in school at a convenient time to study an industry that was just starting to spread. Uh, and so there's been really uh, an unlimited number of topics that I could have been working on uh, were it not for you know, wasting time, teaching classes, and other aspects of the job. It's something I could have done as a full-time type thing. There's like five or six different national and international firms that just do consulting work on uh, gambling. But I really like the teaching deal, so I kind of, this is an ideal situation where you get to teach some, do some research, and then later in your career you can do some consulting, so that's what I uh, started to do. But the research areas that I've looked at related to gambling, uh, if you're, a lot of you guys, if your students are from states outside of South Carolina, uh, just today someone forwarded me a article that said there's some committee exploring the possibility of legalizing gambling aside from the lottery in South Carolina, which is unlikely to happen. But even here it's become an issue. But there's roughly 30 of the states that have commercial gambling, and so each time those states look at legalizing, or have looked at legalizing it, they want some uh, data or some explanation of what are the likely effects going to be if they do introduce casinos. Now it turns out, I think, most politicians don't really care. They want to get tax revenues uh, so they have more money to spend, and that's what it comes down to for a lot of them. But there's a lot of pretty interesting issues which uh, other people uh, and some politicians care about, which include the social costs affiliated with gambling. This has been probably the most interesting thing that I've looked at, which deals with um, about 1% of the population, it turns out, develops a problem with gambling, similar to drug problems or alcohol problems, where they more or less lose control of their behavior or do the activity to an extent that it causes problems in their family life or uh, financially for them. And then those people often will develop a variety of other problems, including drug problems, uh, alcohol problems, or engaging in theft to get money to, gamble, so the, to, to go gamble. So the social cost issues have been the most interesting aspect of the research for me because it kind of uh, crosses the lines of psychology and sociology, uh, other fields. So I have you know, I've had to get pretty familiar with that literature on addiction also. So, um, there's been, uh, you know, in economics we really want data to be able to do analysis, and so as a relatively new industry, um, there wasn't a lot of it initially, but now there's plenty. And since casinos are pretty common now, there's, uh, there's been some newer issues that have come about, including poker, online gambling over this past year, sports gambling has become a big deal because just overturning uh, a law that prevented those types of sports gambling. So uh, it's a really interesting field. I've, I've enjoyed it. And uh, I don't know a lot about the sports betting stuff because I don't do it personally. But uh, that's where I'm trying to kind of move into uh, looking at the future. But it's something that uh, I've really enjoyed the ability to uh, study. And it's much more interesting than things like homothetic production functions or other <laughs> stuff in graduate school. You know, never used, and you know, so it's it's a really interesting application of some of the ideas that you guys, as students, will learn as theories. 
And to me, the big the surprising thing has been that you know, I, I don't know if I've ever drawn, well, I've drawn a few graphs in my work outside of the classroom. But if you're an econ, you know it's just all graphs. But a lot of the stuff that we do is, is not that. That's just kind of a model of how to think. But uh, anyway, I'll stop. Well, uh, I want to thank Keith for the invitation here. Uh, I appreciate it. So uh, sports economics is really very new. Uh, and by that I mean 15 years ago when I was in graduate school, economists did not look upon sport as being particularly relevant as a field. And uh, the sports people didn't see economics as particularly useful as a field. And in the last 15 years, that has changed dramatically. It was first, it was the baseball folks, because the baseball folks understand statistics. and so. When economists said, hey, there's more to this than just finding a statistical relationship, there's also the question of why the effects are what they are. Because economists are good at two very different skill sets. Uh, the first one is we're very good at modeling things, right? figuring out the relationship between X and Y and theorizing why that might be the case. And then the second thing is testing those theories with uh, econometrics, with statistics. And so the statisticians in baseball were great at the latter, but the former, trying to figure out why these relationships were as they were, that was something else entirely. Now, today, it's an entirely different story. So many organizations have put their faith in the quants. Those quantitative people who love their spreadsheets, who can't get enough of their data sets and their databases, and want to collect even more and more data so that we can test even more and more theories and find other relationships and strategic advantages on the field or on the court, well, now it's a big story. And it's a story that we all know. It's not just in baseball, right? Three years ago, four years ago now, uh, Sports Illustrated said, Houston Astros are going to win the World Series. Why did they think that? Well, it was because of the moves that the Houston Astros were making on the basis of quantitative analysis, and it worked. Uh, the reason why the Golden State Warriors are as they are was because of a quantitative analysis that looked at what kind of shots a team should be taking in order to get the most total value from their points. And in football, this is increasingly the story. Uh, the uh, Raiders got rid of their star receiver, Amari Cooper, traded him for a couple of draft picks. Why? They put their faith in statistical analysis. And the Browns have done the same thing. And no offense to those of you who are Browns fans, they might as well put their faith in something other than what they've been doing. And really, anything, get, you know, get a cat to pick your team. I don't care. Choose something else. Well, they, they put their faith in quants. And as a result, I think uh, this next year, I don't know if they're going to be great, but I think they're going to be one of the more interesting teams to watch. That's for certain. So uh, to that end, there's a variety of different analysis uh, topics that can be done. And I taught a sports econometrics class here last semester. And I, I see there's a couple of my students in there uh, in here today. Uh, and, and the topics were as wide as possible. One of the reasons why I wanted to teach that sports econometrics class was because I wanted to introduce people to the statistics of economics. I wanted to introduce people to econometrics, but econometrics can be very intimidating because unless you know a lot of economic theory, you're going to have a hard time putting that theory into statistical analysis. But sports econometrics solves that problem. There's people in that class who knew well more about motorcycle racing or soccer or high school hockey than I ever could know. They knew their theory. They knew their model. They knew the conventional wisdom in the sport. Now we can test it. Now we can take the statistical analysis of econometrics and test it. And this is the wonder of economics, as I said before, that works in, with statistics, but over and above statistics by trying to figure out why the relationships exist as they do and using those to evaluate a variety of different things. It doesn't just have to be performance on the court or on the field. Uh, I published a paper that looked at voting in college football to try and find any biases in uh, how college coaches voted for uh, the weekly polls. 
And what we found with that was that they didn't necessarily vote their own team higher, but they loved voting higher their opponents. Right? So the teams that they actually played, they thought were great. Not everyone else thought they were great. But, but if I played them, then I think they're great. That's a revelation that we can find by looking at the statistics and then understanding that, oh, well, it makes your strength of schedule look better, right? So the economists can go, oh, that's the incentive. That's why they're doing it. So it can be off the field matters that we study as well. And economics is a giant toolbox. And the more you study economics, the more tools you have in your toolbox, and the more and different analysis you're going to be able to do. And I think that's probably my time. All right, well, welcome everybody to Adam Smith Week. I'm so happy to be here for this week. I love coming to these things. The most important thing you can do all year is come to this week's <laughs> event. Let me tell you why. This is something special. This year's theme is about the economic <laughs> way of thinking. And by the way, you've got to be careful with this chair is this cool little thing. Every time I do that, you guys know it's like three times I did that. I'm just sitting here, and if you put your foot wrong, just go <laughs> I have to come with a stand up because I don't want to do that. Anyway, so the whole week is about the economic way of thinking. And that's actually why I got so interested in economics, is the economic way of thinking. I remember my, uh, my first semester of college, my dad wanted to be an accounting major, so I went off to college and signed up to be an accounting major. And I sat through accounting one, financial accounting, and oh my God, I was like, this is horrible. Like this, if this is what I'm gonna do in my life, I just don't wanna do this, you know? And I went into my economics class, I had an honors econ class, and a really good professor that taught economic public issues book, and he was talking all this crazy stuff, like about how airbags and cars kill people and make cars more dangerous, and about drug legalization. I'm like, this is my major, man. I don't know what I'm doing. So I switched over to econ, and uh, my life's never been the same. I've, I think that economics really is a way of thinking, and I think that it's something that we all love because we all want to know why. We see things in the world we just don't understand sometimes, and we say, why? You know, why is this the way it is? And the way we go about figuring those things out is by trying to use logic and analysis to figure things out, and that's what economics it, it, it does at its finest. You know, In economics, we always want to look at who are the individuals involved, the people. We don't think about government, we think about people, like who are the voters, who are the politicians involved, we think about a business, we think who are the people managing the business, who are the people involved, what are their incentives, the cost and benefits they face, you know, when they're making decisions, what rewards do they have, positive rewards, negative rewards, cost, benefits, incentives, and then we usually try to ask something like, do those incentives differ across people, or is there are certain rules you can change that would change the incentives or rewards that people have, and, how would people respond to that? And it's a very powerful way of looking at the world. Um, and it's, there's some good to it and some bad to it. The good to it is that you understand a lot of the world. Um, the bad part is you tend to overanalyze everything, just driving down the road every day. I kid you not, on my way into work today, I'm sitting there and I saw this Volvo, and I've been following down the road for a little bit. You know, I'm always wary, wary of Volvos because you know you think Volvo advertises itself as the safest car on the road. So I want to give you a little economic way of thinking thing real quick. What kind of people would buy a car that advertises itself as the safest car on the road? <laughs> Just think it through, like the why, right? There's two kinds of people that would buy that car. People who are such bad drivers, they know they're gonna get into a wreck and just wanna survive it. Or people who are so deathly scared of getting in a wreck, they drive really slow and carefully. I don't wanna be around either one of those people on my way in, you know what I'm saying? So the problem is, is I, I tend to do that. If you ask my, my loved ones in my life, my family, they'll tell you that you know, being around me, you just got to put up with some over analysis of um, don't ever say Clint gives away free gifts. You know, it just doesn't work in an economics world. You pay for those the rest of the year, everything you buy. But on the other hand, the best part of it is it means almost everything in the world is open for economic analysis, which means the best place to come up with paper ideas and research ideas in economics is having beers with your friends. And what is more fun than having beers with your friends and talking about economics? Nothing, right? So I'm here today to tell you about one of those ideas that was an idea over beers with friends. In fact, two of my friends sitting right at the table, um, Dr. Walker and Dr. Calcando. So um, I got a little excerpt that I want to show as part of this and, and see how we approach this with some economics, if I can figure this out real quick. So, we're having a beer. I can't remember whose house it was. I think it was Dr. Walker's house. Yeah, we like 
having a beer, and the TV's on, and it's just on in the background. And on comes one of these reality TV shows about saving the failing businesses. And we start watching it, and it's pretty funny, but it starts off this whole idea for a paper. So in the end, we end up writing a paper that just uh, came out uh, not too long ago in a fairly good journal. Uh, it's co-authored with uh, uh, two of them, as well as my daughter, Reagan Silva, who many of you know, who's here as well, who's a College of Charleston graduate last year. Anyway, you know, we know businesses close all the time. There's nothing weird about that. In fact, there's something really good about that. Do you want Blockbuster still around? Like, you think you want to go Blockbuster and chill tonight? You guys don't know, but that's what we used to do, right? Is that we used to do stuff like that. But, you know, it's like these things are out of business because we don't shop there anymore. And that's a good thing. Why is it a good thing? It's a good thing because it frees up those storefronts for other people to go try something. Bad restaurants close. Is that good or bad? Good, because we want somebody who's like Sean Brock to come in, and there's an empty space in town, and he can open up Husk, right? That's exactly what we want. Right, Swing and Swine on Savannah Highway, if you've ever been there, I grew up here. That place was four different places that all went out of business before it was Swig and Swine. I'm so happy for Swig and Swine. But it was like a window tint shop for a while. That was like, and it's like all these things. And going out of business is a good thing. Businesses go out of business for all sorts of reasons. One reason is that the owners just don't belong owning a business. It's so easy in America to start a business. A lot of people just do it, and they don't know what they're getting into. It happens all the time. It can happen because you're a really good business owner, and maybe you're your product is something that people don't want anymore. I don't know, but it turns out there's shows whose whole purpose of this in life is to save these things. Do they work? Is that good that they do this? I don't know, but doesn't that sound like a cool question to spend some time looking on? It sure does, right? So I don't know not everybody is familiar with these shows. So I just want to make sure you, you kind of get the gist of this. The very first of these shows, which is probably the one most people know, is Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares. And this is a trailer for when it first premiered in 2007. So Gordon Ramsay is actually the entrepreneur who starts this whole chain of reality TV. So this is just a very quick excerpt from season one trying to advertise what their show is about. It'll give you a flavor for what I want to talk to you about tonight. For the last three years, Chef Ramsay has whipped aspiring chefs into shape on Hell's Kitchen. This is Get out. Now, Gordon Ramsay, the most successful restaurateur on the planet, with critically acclaimed restaurants in London, Dubai, Tokyo, and New York, is crisscrossing America for the most difficult assignment of his career. This is disgusting. I'm Ghostman. Turning around America's kitchen nightmare. Please help me. Each week, you will go to restaurants on the brink of disaster. Very it normal. He's not doing his job. His place is a disaster zone. He puts so much into it. But to get these restaurants back on track, Chef Ramsay will hold nothing back. I've never, ever, ever, ever met someone I believe in as little as you. Give me a little chance. Eternity pig. We need a death in the restaurant before someone gets a grill. It will be emotional. Okay, 
things. That's it. You can see how entertaining these are, right? We're sitting around going, hey, let's watch this show, right? These are, they're yelling at each other. It's the worst food I've ever had. He's throwing it out of his mouth. You know, and then he's a savior, right? Like the place is, is closing, and then they, they remodeled the place, and they open it up, and it's beautiful, and then the episode ends. And what's the first question you have? I wonder what happened to that place? Like the episode just ends. Like what happened? Does this stuff work? Does it not work? So we get this idea to maybe follow up on this show. Well, guess what? Turns out the minute you get to a research project, it always gets more complex than you thought. Because every time we thought we knew that all the shows, turns out somebody said, did you know there's one that saves hair salons? No, we didn't know there was one that saved hair salons. Yeah, it's called Tabitha's Salon Takeover. And then you get that show coded, and then somebody says, you know, there's one that saved failing bakeries. Like on some esoteric channel, I didn't even know exactly. Anyway, turns out that at the time we did the study, there was 11 of these shows. There's now been two more launched since we completed our paper. There's a garage rehab, which is the funniest one of the whole lot, that saves failing um, auto mechanic garages around the country. Um, and there's also a new Gordon Ramsay one, uh, Hell on Wheels, um, that he does. Those are the two new ones. But anyway, so we got into this and decided, why don't we follow up with all five of these businesses? How are they doing? These things work? Are, are they saving these places? What do you guys think? Well, let's just give you an example from one show. This is Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares, the one we just watched the promo for. So let's just take this a little at a time. So season one had two sets, two parts. There was 10 uh, establishments he visited in set one, 11 in set two for 21 for season one total. Uh, as of June 16, 20 of those 21 were closed. So about 95% of those were closed. So going to season two, out of the 11 he visited, as if they nine of them were closed. And, all right, so if you look, about 70% of all of the ones that he uh, saved closed. All right, that's a bad way to look at this, and that's one thing we thought, because really, you know, every business, so many, every year so many businesses fail. In fact, in eating and drinking establishments, every year about 17%, 16.7 fail. So it's really a better way to look at this and say, what's an average annual failure rate? Turns out that's a failure rate of about 30% of them per year, which is significantly higher than the industry failure rate. In fact, twice as high as the industry failure rate. So Gordon Ramsay isn't too good. Think the other people are as good, better, or worse? Well, it turns out they're all really suck. Um, except for one of the shows, The Profit. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But yeah, I don't care if you're trying to save bakeries, Asian restaurants, hotels, uh, salons. Yeah, these things aren't doing too good. They've got higher than industry uh, failure rates. And just because somebody said, hey, you should look at the Yelp scores, we also looked at the Yelp scores. Turns out, interestingly enough, most of them, the Yelp scores fall after the renovation, uh, which is surprising. So all of a sudden, we're in a place where you say, what? what? That makes no sense. I thought they were trying to save these. They renovate. It looks great. Why? And that's the beauty of economics is the why. So the whole point of the research isn't that. It's to try to figure out why. Why do these things not work? Should they work? Well, that's where the power of economics comes in. When they're picking restaurants to put on there as failing restaurants, which ones do you think they pick? The ones that are easiest to save? Or the ones that create the most drama that they can put on TV with fighting owners and invite? Yes, of course. Right? What what are the hosts trying to create? A TV show. So you've got to ask yourself, as an individual, with Gordon Ramsay and his production crew, are trying to put together a show, what do they care about? Entertaining TV. And it turns out that there's research on stuff like The Biggest Loser and these others, and they don't do very good either. So long story short is there's a principal agent problem. The, the people coming in to save these businesses really don't have the same incentives as the business owner. And they're, they're, Gordon Ramsay's incentive is not to save the business. It's to try to make a good TV show, and that affects a lot of them. Which establishments are selected? They're not always the ones that are easy to save. Many aren't even failing, in fact, it turns out. What are shown as problems? One of Dr. Walker's favorite parts of this whole thing is on Bar Rescue, they always pack these establishments with like a line after like 800 people, and then he yells at the service staff the whole time about how they can't handle 800 people. Look, if the problem was they couldn't serve fast enough, they wouldn't be on the show. The problem is they get two customers a night, right? Like the problem isn't that they're horrible at serving thousands of people. The problem is they can't get people in the door. A lot of people come when John Taffer's there. Right? So it's like they do all this crazy stuff. They identify problems that aren't problems. Anyway, 
It affects a lot of things, like which changes aren't made. One of our favorite things about this, when you start looking at it, this is a bathroom, if you can see it on the upper left, that's actually now in a, a restaurant that was saved by Bar Rescue. You ask yourself, what? That's right, they don't actually go in and fix the stuff that needed to fix in the building. What they do is fix the stuff that their sponsors have product placements for. I'll show you that in a minute. Well, this is great. I mean, you read these reviews. I don't know, this is another one. Now, did Bar Rescue quit in the middle of the renovation? That could be the only explanation. Like, people don't want to visit the restaurant because of this. But did he do that? Did he fix the bathrooms? No. Here's what he did instead. from a toilet manufacturer and asphalt company. <laughs> Otherwise, they would have fixed the parking lot and the toilet, right? So, you know, the beauty is, is when you find something like these shows, it's fun to ask, do they work? But every time you get into it, you start asking the whys. You know, why does this stuff not work? And so, you know, basically, a lot of these places are failing because they probably should fail. They're run by people who probably don't really belong in business anyway. Um, and then they don't have the same incentive. With that said, I'll conclude with the one show that's different from all this is called The Profit. If you've ever seen it on TV, it's fundamentally different. The Profit, Marcus Limonis, actually owns, he takes ownership share of the business. He writes a check, takes like 50% ownership in the business. He doesn't just save it and leave. He actually takes own, and he has a strong incentive to make sure that business survives because he's entitled to half of the value of that business going forward. So he's the one uh, TV reality show that does actually save failing businesses because his eliminates the principal agent problem. Anyway, so that's the cool research that we were working on um, that I think is just a, a good example of how you can take the tools of economics to help understand the world around you. Um, and I'll make a pitch real quick for uh, something else. Now, there's a lot of good events coming on this week, but in terms of understanding the world around you, you've got two of the nation's leading people in doing that coming to visit your campus this week. Um, uh, Pete Leeson is coming, I think it's Wednesday night, um, and to talk about some of his stuff. But Pete Leeson, his first job was with me when I was uh, up in West Virginia. And he's just a really cool figure. He's got a book on pirates and pirate economics. And I mean, he's a, he's a great guy. And we've got Stephen Landsberg, I think, coming uh, Thursday night. He's that armchair economist. And you know, my favorite little clip from his book was, he told his daughter, she says, if you're not missing airline flights, you're spending too much time in airports. Like if you make every flight in your life, you've wasted too much time at airports. But anyway, so there's a lot of cool people, and I know that reality TV may not be the best of it, but a lot of people have used reality TV to look at the cops TV shows and The Biggest Loser and a lot of these other things to ask, do they work? And if not, why not? Uh, so there you go. Thanks for having me. I'll do a, um, a quick follow-up. Uh, just on with each of um, them with, uh, and, and sort of comments based on everyone's remarks, and then we'll open it up for um, uh, Q&A. And right, everybody thinks that econ is incredibly boring. Um, only if you understand sort of what most people think it is. Right? Most people think it's somehow business related, or it's uh, just about the stock market, or it has to do with macro stuff like inflation. And you know, <laughs> so all the things my students hear. <laughs> we treat Mark as though he's an honorary microeconomist. Um, right? The macro stuff on the news, yeah, that's actually really pretty boring, right? But if you start to look at the world, and, and the idea here, I think, is one of um, uh, the phrase that Robert Frank uses, the economist is naturalist. To look out at the world around you, and if you understand these tools and say, okay, why would reality shows, right? And we've got some friends that have um, uh, did a paper on the cops reality show, and they sat through and watched cops. And after we had posted that we had published this paper, they were like, "That sounds like a lot more fun to watch than what we did," right? Um, in terms of the shows, um, I, I do want to make one comment about Mark, and, and I really want to see if you'll put some thought into this and leave him up. Is 
So we had a former um, colleague that used to be here at the college, Charles Todd <laughs> Nesbitt, uh, who we've all met and know, and he was actually a student of, of Russ Sobel's, um, who is a diehard Cleveland Browns fan. We can't figure this out, right? In other words, incentives do not make any sense here, right? This is where, um, you know, and so I, I hope that Todd now has something to look forward to and that the, the, the Browns are putting their things. If not, come on Wednesday and learn about cultures that use oracles, right, to uh, help to provide stability to the things, and maybe the Browns can look to oracles. I don't know if that doesn't, if that doesn't work. Um, but um, I do want to follow up one other thing with uh, Dr. Walker's comments. Um, maybe talk just really quickly about the political processes and the regulations that go hand in hand with gambling and maybe why that why that is. So uh, pretty much every state bans gambling unless it's specifically authorized. So um, before many of you were born, lotteries kind of spread throughout the US and probably 45 states have lotteries. And those were pretty controversial early on, but then once they were uh, pretty much everywhere, they, they uh, provide money for uh, college scholarships. So whenever it goes, Powerball goes over like a billion dollars, I go out and buy like 100 bucks worth of tickets and say, this is my way of giving back to the students in the college <laughs> education lottery. But the, the casino thing is a little more complicated or controversial because it, a lot of people have a perspective of gambling in the <coughs> world or advice or at least government shouldn't be sponsoring it. And so, uh, whereas the lottery has this uh, you know, give money to education for other good causes, uh, typically casino taxes don't do that, but they're very highly taxed. And so politicians certainly want it because the revenues are taxed anywhere from 20 to 50 percent off the top, then the casinos pay income taxes on top of that if their state has it. So it's a, a really good deal for politicians. And so um, they either, uh, the legislature either passes it or they put it to the voters. And typically nowadays, voters will approve it. So it would probably be approved in South Carolina even if the politicians allowed people to vote on it. Uh, but that political process is something that, that we, we did a paper on. and. Uh, that's even an interesting issue. What, what states are more likely to legalize uh, gambling as a result of uh, you know, how financially strapped they are or whatever. So both issues with voters and then also the politicians. Well, at this point, um, unless anyone has anything they want to follow with, I'll turn it open to uh, uh, Mark, do you have anything that you wanted to follow up on? Oh, well, so I, I would say this. Uh, one of the other wonderful things uh, about working with economics is we do very well when there's uncertainty. Um, but we don't have to have a system of equations that works out perfectly like in physics or in chemistry. We understand uncertainty, that there can be exogenous events that happen that completely change the outcome of a scenario. It could be something like weather in a football game, that all of a sudden it's snowing a lot and you're not going to be able to throw the ball around. Or it could be, to my delight, as a UNC Chapel Hill alum, Zion Williamson's shoe. Oh, what a treat! His Nike shoe broke. I'm pretty sure somewhere in the locker room, Michael Jordan was back there before the game. <laughs> Cut a little hole in the thing. Uh, and so, so because there is this uh, inherent uncertainty in sports, it makes a very interesting to analyze because you're never guaranteed a complete full answer. There's always going to be some wiggle room there. And that wiggle room just allows us to spend more time to try and figure out what exactly is in this that's still unknown. Right, right. There's no guarantee that you're going to be 100% right if you're trying to build a forecast model or 100% wrong. Yeah, I don't know if I can ask a, uh, a question as one of the other panelists or not, but one of the things that I've always found that I love about sports economics is that, you know, in science we always want controlled environments in which we can test things, and it's very hard to find those because so many things in the real world are changing. My favorite sports studies are the ones where they take rule changes, where there's some change in the rules, like all of a sudden we can do two-point conversion down the NFL, or they change the width of the goalpost, or change the number of, of referees in basketball. Wasn't that one of the Tolleson's famous papers on the, yeah. 
So there's always these rule changes that change behavior, and, and seeing people tested in sports is always like one of the coolest things ever. At least all these counterintuitive results. And I hate putting you on the spot. But could you share with the audience any of those? Do you know any of those cool stories about how changes in some of these rules have affected people's behavior in these interesting counterintuitive ways? Well, so so I'll I'll, I'll talk about the big missed opportunity. So the big missed opportunity is this year. Major League Baseball was so close to having a pitch clock. Uh, baseball games take forever. I'm sure you're well aware of this if you've watched a baseball game any time in the last few years. And it's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about having more sports gambling, because I'm pretty sure the only way to make a five-hour baseball game interesting is to be able to gamble on every pitch. <laughs> that, great, great. I'll put a buck down on every pitch. That'll be fun. Nope, this one's going to be a homer. Nope, all right. Well, there's, there's more to drink here. Uh, uh, but a pitch clock uh, would dramatically change the, the behavior of the game in that so often pitchers wave off the signal of what pitch they should be throwing. Uh, this is where catchers, who typically aren't the best batters, but are oftentimes the best baseball minds, are so important because it's the catchers that often send the signals out to the pitcher about what they should be throwing. Fastball, slider, curveball, changeup, all that good stuff. Whatever, whatever the pitcher's uh, you know, favorite throws are. So if all of a sudden the catchers have more authority because there's a pitch clock, you've got to get that throw off, then how does that change the game? Are there certain pitchers that behave better or worse? Are there certain catchers who, because their expertise is going to be followed, are going to end up with a better result for their team? Or, or maybe it gets worse. Maybe that time um, is, is particularly useful to, to heighten strategy. And sadly, we're not going to find out because uh, the, uh, the union of uh, baseball players adamantly fought against this rule change. They did not want to see a clock in baseball because famously clocks don't exist in baseball. Right? Every other sport's got a clock, but baseball can take however long nine innings is going to take. Or you know, infinite innings thereafter. So, but that said, though, I don't. This might just be a pause button on the pitch clock. We might see something go on uh, two, three, four, five years from now uh, that resembles a pitch clock that we would be able to study. The uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the same idea of when the shot clock came in basketball. And if you don't think that consumers um, have a role in sports, right? It was the NCAA. Um, championship in what 81 I think something like that and uh, it was North Carolina and they basically started playing um, past the ball right they was just literally they'd set it up in sort of four corners and they were ahead and they were just running the clock out so they just literally passed the ball around to each other until the clock ran out and they could win and it was the most boring game <laughs> Right? And there were lots of games like that, but this one, right, this is supposed to be the championship game, right? And everybody was expecting it. And they had proposed this before, and that's partly what really pushed to have that shot clock in there, is that, the, you know, the fans really pushed and sort of helped, and they saw that opportunity. And, you know, the entrepreneurs who came in with the shot clock said, okay, this is the time, right? We're going to recognize when there's, a, there's an opportunity here. Um, and that's been written on in the column about that. Um, all right, so at this point, um, I'd uh, love to sort of open it up and see if any of you have questions for any of our panelists or in general. And, um, it doesn't have to be a question for anyone in particular, but just a question about sort of you know, the economic way of thinking or one of their areas um, uh, of specialty. This is um, on the sports economic system because that's something um, you talked a little bit about the difference between being um, predictive and being, being, being used, data being used to explain what's already happening. Um, is part of the uncertainty, I mean, is, I know you can go out and gather a lot of data, and especially on something like baseball, but does that uncertainty actually like limit you and how, much, how accurately you actually can predict something? Because like, you could say, okay, the Browns are going to be better this year because they've got such a number of picks or whatever characteristics you're looking at. Um, but isn't there, isn't there, aren't there so many variables that 
there's just no way to accurately predict, oh, this team's going to win this amount of games. Because if you did, then you could go to um, Vegas and there would be this intersection between the gambling discipline that you could, I'm, I'm sure, make a lot of money that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked this. There was a paper that I wrote uh, with a friend of mine that looked at uh, trying to find ways to exploit uh, gambling lines in college football. And uh, my buddy was really clever, way more clever than I was, and he wrote a spider that worked in SAS that went out to different websites and gathered just reams and reams of data uh, about the different teams. And one of the things that we found that was relevant was injury data. So injuries had a way of forecasting outcome of these college football games that the Vegas line was not controlling for. So we looked at it and said, okay, great, all right, so there's this slight advantage here, right? So, so how profitable is this slight advantage? And I can't remember the exact uh, APR that we were getting on this uh, bet, but it was, I want to say about 5%. So, okay, great, 5%, you can almost beat the stock market. Congratulations. <laughs> You go through a whole lot of risk because your your bets are either win or lose, right? It's zero or one. Um, but the reality is that that return on that wasn't so high. And so this is one of the things that I also, often uh, I see in the literature. I see when I, I read other papers for review. Uh, oftentimes people will say, "I found it! I found the secret. This is this is the, how you can exploit the gambling lines." And it turns out that that secret uh, isn't actually all that profitable. And the issue is as well, if you're looking at a certain vintage of data, say 2009 to 2015, well, it might be that 2009 to 2015, sure that advantage was there, but is it gonna be there in 2019? Because let me assure you, the bookies are very clever. They get paid a lot of money to be ahead of the schlub sitting on the couch. And, and as a result, you know, they, it seems like they are always that one step ahead, and we're always checking the vintage of data to see what they've been learning over time. Um, this is a question for Doug. Um, you, you, you talked about uh, uncertainty, and uh, gambling is obviously about uncertainty. That's what makes it fun. Um, I was wondering if you've done any uh, statistical modeling or uh, just studies on like the decisions of gambling and also like related to like advantage play. Um, I've done some like reading on like the work of James Roshi um, and uh, like some of the how he applies economics to um, gambling. Uh, it's like, I don't, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, most of what I do has looked at not the individual gambler's decisions on a particular day, but more what will happen in South Carolina if we were to legalize a few casinos, what that could be bad for the state, the regional economy. Uh, and then the social impacts to society. So I look at more of an overall impact as opposed to specific bets. But there's one exception to that, which is a paper that I worked on with Russ uh, and a few other people have looked at. If you put limits on your bets, either the amount of time you play at the casino, for example, your losses or your wins, how will that affect players average losses. And what it that ends up showing is you know the less you play, the less you lose, which isn't surprising to anyone. Uh, but no I don't I don't I haven't looked too much at specific uh, bets or behavior in particular bets. So that's one of those other things that I want to have to find. Seems one of the things that may have impacted behavior much in the sports world is camera. stuff and changing the behavior of the athlete in terms of what they're willing to do to gain an advantage yeah. to try to beat the system that way. Sure. Uh, so uh, basketball has been particularly interesting in this uh, in that it was about, I want to say maybe nine years ago, that in the NBA they introduced uh, basically cameras all over the court. So they can track individual player movements to see uh, upon occasion whether or not a player was making, and this has been the, the real revelation. I mean, we got uh, Vince Carter is, what is he, 94? I don't know how old Vince Carter is in the NBA right now, but uh, 
Well, I think, I think, I don't know, someone might, you have the internet. At least 41. 41, okay, all right, so I was a little bit older. Um, uh, but one of the reasons why we're seeing players last longer is because in looking at the data, one of the things that they were very capable of doing was telling players what movements were causing injury and then how to avoid that movement so that they can avoid the injury and they can prolong their careers. And that has worked remarkably well. In terms of its ability to change performance on the court, that's a little more mixed. But uh, I think it, it's advantageous, in particular for the NBA, which relies upon their star power in order to attract viewers and thus attract dollars, uh, that they keep those stars playing for longer and longer. Uh, so that uh, an injury doesn't cut short a promising career. One of the things that I think is um, interesting with respect to that and, and, uh, is rules in play uh, was several years ago when the referees in the NFL went on strike. And so, if you remember this, they brought in college and amateur reps, right? The, the, was the reps are our union, right? And they, uh, so they went out in mass. And so they brought in uh, college reps and amateur reps. And these guys were not as capable of catching all the penalties and seeing what was going on, right? And the players understood that. Right? The players understood that. For that season, right, that, those games got rough. Um, there were, you know, there were a lot of penalties that didn't get called that should have got called when they saw them. They were able to go back on cameras and so forth and say the reps missed this call, uh, they missed this play, right? Uh, there was a lot of talk about, you know, the players playing a little rougher, a little dirtier because they knew that the reps weren't going to catch, they weren't as sharp, they weren't as in tune, right? So you change the incentives here in terms of they, they recognize that these reps aren't going to be, they're not going to be policed as much, and guess what happens, right? You know, they, they turn to activities that are a little less than desirable, right? So, um, uh, again, maybe not an unexpected one, but one that, you know, you think about it in terms of the probabilities of getting, uh, getting caught, right? Probabilities went down, and they were willing to take more gambles and play a little rougher and, you know, and do things that uh, potentially would have been, you know, would have been called under um, the NFL right. reps. And, and to piggyback on your point here, this, this all lies in cost and incentives. Right, which economists, we try to, we, we focus that uh, throughout your undergraduate, what, what's the cost, what's the incentive, marginal cost, marginal benefit. And, and we can apply that to, to just about any decision making, because any decision making has some uncertainty, has some risk to it. So trying to then quantify that cost, trying to quantify the benefit, uh, and then figure out what is the best possible decision under those circumstances, that's all part of the fun. I was thinking in particular of the recent call in the Saints game uh, this year. And there were lawsuits filed. Uh, there were fines against the player. Uh, I suspect we're going to see a rule change in the NFL to, to, to recover in some sense. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting you mention that because one of the things that's long been an issue is in the NFL they can throw the challenge flag, right? The red flag, they throw it on the field. It's very dramatic against the green grass saying, Someone has made a mistake. I, I protest. Uh, and then it goes into the booth, and then we can all go get another drink. This is going to take a while. And uh, then, then, generally speaking, the resolution is exactly what you would expect when you watch the cameras. However, pass interference has never been a challengeable offense. Many other things that you can challenge, but that's one ruling that you can't. And I think it's entirely plausible that, yeah, next year, you're going to be able to challenge a pass interference call. There was a lot of economic benefit that came out of that. The New Orleans decided that they were going to have anti-Super Bowl parties, right? And I think they played in 2000. all over New Orleans were playing like the 2010 or whatever it was in the uh, 12, whenever uh, the Saints went to the World Series, they replayed the game everywhere, and people just came out, right? It was actually, they were saying that it was a real economic benefit to the city, right? More so than the usual well, Super Bowl Sunday. Was it enough to make up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and actually now, okay, so now I'm thinking about this, uh, and I, I'd be, uh, my points would be more clear if we did have one beer right now, but, uh, <laughs> but it occurs to me, if you could challenge pass interference calls, then 
those cornerbacks are going to know the eyes are on them. Right now, it is a, it is, if there's a long ball thrown down the field, because the long ball has disappeared dramatically from the NFL because it's considered too risky, right? But, but if you can challenge pass interference calls, it changes how cornerbacks and safeties behave. Because right now, cornerbacks and safeties, they see that ball going over their head, and they, they instantly shove the receiver. They'll take the pass interference call, right? They don't want to have to give up the long ball and the touchdown. Well, if that then becomes re reviewable, then no, I, I foresee the teams that are going to take advantage of that who have you know quarterbacks with strong arms are going to start seeing those 40, 50, 60 yard bombs down the field to take advantage of the fact that, aha, well, if that cornerback just nudges him slightly, we've got him. And, and we're going to have the pass interference call. That'd be fun. Uh, well, I mean, it would give us more delays in the game, but uh, it might, might open up the field a little bit so that we don't just have to watch two or three yard throws all the time. Tom Brady. <laughs> I'll, I'm not um, going to see any other questions, but one of the things that kept coming up is the whole idea of that there is uncertainty in the world, right? As, as economists, we're social scientists, and so we don't have these, you know, we look at sort of, we do our best to sort of look at natural experiments. Um, and this is one of the things about economics that one makes it fun, but also makes it challenging, is, is that there's usually not. Um, you know, different situations call for different um, scenarios, and especially when you move into the world that I like to study, which is politics, right? Now you're talking about a whole host of variables that can be different, and now, whereas we may have predictive aspects about saying, okay, what's going to happen if we have this rule change in the NFL, and then we can sort of see people's incentives, um, rules changes that occur in, say, South Carolina at the politics level aren't necessarily going to be the same in Arizona or going to be the same out in California, right? We have different people, different sets of values, and so forth, and uncertainty there. And so, you know, we've got to be, we've got to understand as economists that what we want to deal with is, is the reality as best we can, right? And this is part of what, again, makes it fun, but also makes it interesting. Um, I'll, I'll throw it out here if there's any one last question. I got a real quick one. This is for Dr. Sybil, and I, this is just something that's me. I know it's outside of, this, outside of the scope of this paper, um, but all I was thinking about with the principal agent problem and TV hosts and people on the show was American Idol or other um, singing shows. Um, did this um, deliver anything? Did you ever come across something where a show like that or a show trying to discover maybe singing talents? Um, the TV hosts were actually trying to find people who were maybe really dramatic or made for really interesting contestants, but not the best singers? Does that mean anything like that? I've never seen anybody do anything on that. That's a real interesting thing. I mean, obviously, if you watch it, they tend to put, especially during the auditions, some of the, like, these outrageously bad. You know they have no, there's no reason those people should have made it there other than to provide entertaining TV, right? right. But I think what's really interesting about the reality show with regard to the, uh, the way that they do those contests so poorly is that the commercial success of somebody like Daughtry, far exceeds the actual season winner, shows the difference in the way that they do the voting, where anybody can vote, vote as many times as you want, the difference in that commercial success, right? And I think that those shows, though, have, have a strong incentive to try to uncover something good, because I think that they do actually take some ownership stake or revenue stake in the stars that they generate. Like, I think when you are on American Idol and you end up having a career, you owe them some money. Oh, okay. Right, so you know, and they try to sell that stuff on iTunes. So I do think that there there is something there that creates this incentive that helps to align the incentives of the show with actually identifying talent. But I think the fact that they put on those people gives it exactly what you're saying. Right, those people aren't identifying talent; they're just doing it to make entertaining TV. And what they're trying to do is make entertaining TV that gets sponsorships. Right, so. Uh, one more uh, fantasy sport. Uh, I have some colleagues who have started crowding, and uh, it's bigger than actual sports already in terms of revenue and generation of profit. And it seems to be a really interesting futurist nexus between gambling, sports, technology, virtual reality. They're doing all the transactions of blockchain. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it was interesting. A few years ago, uh, this was even bigger, uh, but the attorneys general of the United States decided to get on this act and start regulating it. And 
one of the things that they found in looking at the data of these fantasy sports competitions, these weekly competitions that would occur between millions of people, um, is they found that sure enough, there were people who were good at fantasy sports. There were people who were, who were doing consistently well. And it was that 1% of very knowledgeable individuals basically uh, beating the 99% that was just throwing a team together that week willy-nilly and throwing five, 10 bucks on it. Um, and uh, you know, I guess that, that's an interesting aspect of it as well in that generally speaking, you would have a bookmaker who, who that's the one who all the, all the rents, all the, the profits go to. And in this scenario, the bookmaker had no incentive to have one or another individual win. So the bookmakers effectively became that 1% of very uh, uh, well-informed and capable gamblers uh, who were taking everybody else's lunch. Um, yeah, I, I think, honestly, uh, the, the introduction of sports gambling, as that rolls out to more and more states and as that becomes more and more prevalent, I think we're going to find a lot more interest in a lot of terrible games. And uh, that's not necessarily a, a good or a bad thing, but I think that uh, if I was ESPN with my, my disturbingly low ratings, I would be very excited about this. Well, I'll take a minute to um, uh, point out again, this is the um, URL, but if you go to this URL, you will see a survey, and then you'll be able to put in your attendance verification. We would love everybody's feedback on the event as a whole. So please take the time to go out and, and fill out the survey um, and indicate if you need me to your faculty member that you were here in attendance. Um, I want to encourage you all to come out for the remaining events this week. There are flyers with the remaining events as well as the overall calendar for this week, so please grab them on the way out. If you like what you've seen uh, with regards to the center, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, right? Um, and follow up on what we're doing with our events. We also have information about the center um, and about the Market Process College program. So thank you all, and um, hopefully I will see you later on this week.